Okay, so we'll start off with introductions quickly. Uh, I'm Gary Adaman. Uh, I'm the WCA chairman, and I've been with the club since about 2010, and I'm the executive for about five, six years now, and <coughs> chairman for the last three. And maybe Luigi, you can go next. Yeah, so I'm Luigi. I will be hosting the uh, WA, some, uh, WCA presentation. Hope everyone's well, happy new year, and uh, lots of good information for you people. I've been with the club since 2011, so quite some time. So uh, again, I hope everyone gets comfy and grabs themselves a uh, favorite espresso or tea, and we'll, we'll get the show going shortly. Hi there, everybody. I'm Carolyn Heslop. I work at the Canoe Museum and uh, have been camping a few times. I'm just outside of Peterborough, Ontario. Excellent. Uh, hi, I'm Claudia. I'm um, with the club since 2010. Uh, I was uh, twice on the um, uh, Canoe Symposium in Toronto. I lived in Ontario in the 90s, canoeing since quite a while. And most of the time I'm living in Germany again. But I, I keep contact with my friends in, in Ottawa. So I'm in Canada off and on and most of the time also canoeing. Okay. Are you in Germany right now? Yes. Wow. Um, I love that. I got, the, I got into <laughs> winter camping in the 90s when I was in Ontario. Yeah. You know, uh, there are seven members in Europe and I think there's four or five, I can't remember now, in Germany. So yep. that is excellent. I know one who is living in Austria. Yes. The other ones I don't I don't know about. Okay. I think it's one guy in Switzerland and yeah, I think it was Austria. You're right. Yeah. 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 Netherlands. Netherlands was the other one. Yeah, so it's okay. four countries. Germany, Netherlands, Austria, and Switzerland. Excellent. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Lewis Williams. Good morning, Carolyn. Um and I uh like to spend quite a bit of time outdoors. Yeah, I see you're outdoors right now. I am <laughs> with uh, many with many organizations, and and um, as a thank you to the uh, editors of that uh, fabulous magazine, it's probably the best of many that I receive. Yeah. Hi there, uh, Ken Murray. I've been a member for probably less than a month, uh, but uh, really enjoying it. Uh, I've been a paddler for a while. And um, I'm normally uh, calling from uh, uh, Toronto, and today I'm in isolation in Nova Scotia. Okay, excellent. We got Brian Rice next. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian from Alberta. I'm actually not part of the club. Um, this was extended out to uh, us at Frostbite. So I'm okay. part of Frostbite. Um, if you don't know what Frostbite is, it's the Winter Camping Symposium out west. And um, this would have been our seventh year, and uh, we had to, to cancel except for keynotes and online stuff. So, yeah, yeah, same thing's happening to our symposium in February. But you know, that's what you got to do. Um, yeah, you got to got to play by the rules. <laughs> yep. Hi everyone. Um, I feel like a bit of a fraud because uh, I just joined the WCA like three days ago, <laughs> but I've been on my CCR and uh, stuff for like 10, 15 years. Uh, I've been uh, hot tenting for about, uh, I'd say six, seven years now. Uh, Kawartha's Algonquin Tomogamy, uh, multi-day trips with uh, uh, snowshoes and uh, generally snowshoes and the toboggan. Uh, otherwise I'd paddle and do all the stuff, but yeah. Thanks for having me. I believe we're at uh, Kate Foley. Yeah, that would be me. That's actually Brian. I'm using my girlfriend's tablet. Yeah, okay. no worries. Huh? So, does uh, your wife know? <laughs> yeah, actually, she hooked me up. <laughs> like I'm, uh, I'm not exactly uh, technically uh, proficient with uh, Zoom meetings and things, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I am a New York state guide. I am a main guide. Um, I've been hot tenting for a while, but I'm actually looking for, you know, I like to share experiences. I like to look for uh, new, uh, new tips and tricks and things like that to help people along. And, you know, if I got anything that I could share, you know, I'd love to share it as well. So. Excellent. Well, welcome. 
Hey, I'm Jackie. I'm actually from the Winter Camping Symposium in Minnesota. And I've been winter camping for about 10 years. Um, calling from in from Ely right now. Excellent. Welcome. Hi, uh, Christopher from uh, London, Ontario. Uh, still, still looking forward to winter here in London. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll yeah. Be. Hopefully. Hey, Christopher. I'm in uh, London as well, actually. Oh, hi, Marco. We'll have to chat after. Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. Uh, up next is Bob. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm joining from Montana. So thank you for the invite from the Frostbite gentlemen, Mike and David, and uh, also for WCA to extending the information. I've been cold tenting for the most part, except for maybe the occasional super shelter. Um, wow. But looking forward to go pro, <laughs> going pro and uh, have some friends with tents. And yeah, just looking forward to the great information. So thanks, everybody. No problem. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Gerald from the Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Now that's got to be the highest. <laughs> Thanks for Frost oh. for letting us know. Excellent. And Scott, we mentioned no mic. Okay, so I think we've hit everybody. Did we miss okay. everybody? No, I think we're good. I think we should uh, get right into the meat and potatoes of things. Okay. And uh, let, Excellent. Me, let me share my screen. Anyone see that okay? Yep, looks good. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of information for you people. Uh, if you have any questions afterwards, like, oh, I forgot to ask that. I'm just a email, text message, or phone call away. Um, again, I'm, I am here for you if you have any questions. Also sit back, relax, grab yourself your, your favorite uh, cup of joe and we'll get going. So for those of you who are not members, who we are, we're a nonprofit organization. We are a large community of outdoor enthusiasts from across Canada and the USA. Uh, we also own uh, my uh, CCR, Canadian Canoe Roots, uh, which is owned by the WCA. It is a great way to meet people. And we have a philosophy here of paying it forward, just like the previous generation did with us. Now it's our turn to pay it forward and share that knowledge. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's a shot of my, uh, one of my solo trips I did a few years back. So here's a few topics that we're just gonna cover. There's a, again, there's a lot of information I'm gonna give you people. I can easily turn this, turn this into a multiple sort of hour or, or multiple day sort of presentation. It's a lot of information we want to dig deeper into it. So the first thing to do is really is to make a trip itinerary. I took a survival course about 13 years ago and the gentleman uh, doing the presentation, the stats that he gave on people that went lost or missing and how that happened was absolutely alarming. First thing was most people didn't know where they, were, where they were going. Uh, their family or friends had no clue where they were going, whether they were either canoeing or, or hot tenting or what have you, or the area that they were going into. So it's, it's so important to leave behind a trip itinerary for family and friends, which includes anything like provincial park name, crown land area, or the closest town, a put in location, or the area itself, any sort of route, trail that you're gonna be taking along with you, uh, very, very important. Again, time is of the essence when people need to look for you in emergency situations. Uh, closest OPP office with a phone number. Um, I like to give also a vehicle make, license plates, all that information. A lot of times people are like, well, I'm not sure what, what my husband's license plate or vehicle or, or partner or what have you. Uh, time and day that you're planning on leaving the park. It's very, very important because something were to happen, be like, hey, they should have been out of the park by now. And... Also, if no one hears from you by X day or time, then call OPP slash search and rescue. And I'll tell you what happened to me a few years ago. I carry a spot device with me and my spot device actually uh, failed on me. Once I sent it back to the manufacturer, I actually got some information that the circuit board failed. And what it looked like it was actually working. The buttons were flashing, but no signal was being received. And when I finally got out of the park and had some cell coverage and called my, my partner, 
Well, she said, well, I was just about to call uh, OPP in the area because I didn't hear from you for the last several days. So again, it's very, very important that you, you try to communicate and leave behind as much information as you can. As we're more experienced and we, we travel more further and deeper into the bush, there are times where we don't know about the actual area itself, maybe a new area. So you may not know much about that area. So it's always a good idea to also leave behind a plan B route. There, there could be an area where it's impassable and you try to take a, a detour, uh, also try to have that uh, given or left behind for someone, very, very important. So now we're gonna get into car maintenance. I can't tell you the amount of vehicles I've seen over the years, and this will be my 15th year of winter camping, the amount of vehicles that I have not started. And coincidentally, there are always the gasoline vehicles that would not be starting. So we're gonna talk about car maintenance. That's the last thing you wanna do is open your, open your hood and find that kinder surprise of squirrels trying to stash away all the nuts and walnuts in your vehicle, all right? So if you are gonna be servicing your vehicle, I would suggest that you service it at least two weeks before a trip, and I say minimum. The reason is that if there aren't any issues with the vehicle when you're being serviced, you have to bring the vehicle back. You wanna give enough time for them to deal with the, with the issue. When I did a cold camping uh, course about 15 or 16 years ago, my instructor's vehicle actually would not start, and that's because he had his vehicle serviced the day before we went. The uh, technician forgot to tighten a hose clamp and it was uh, drawing in air into his fuel system. And that's why it wouldn't start. The battery is the most common issue for vehicles not starting in cold weather. Uh, basically what you would like to do is have your service center perform a battery test if your vehicle, uh, battery's vehicle is five years and older. As a former licensed automotive technician for 20 years, most of the trouble that I've seen in cold climate were batteries uh, uh, being uh, malfunctioning. And I like to personally carry both a battery booster pack and a jumper cable uh, kit. It's critical to be self-sufficient. So this is what a typical kit looks like. Um, I carry a whole uh, containers worth in my back of my pickup truck. Now, even though you will be on your winter camping trip most of the time, I still leave a little portable Alpine shovel behind. I have tow, uh, tow ropes, everything. That way, again, if, if there's anything were to happen, it's critical to be self-sufficient. A lot of times with people just carrying booster packs, what happens is that they forget to charge them. And yes, they have a, bo a booster pack, but they're like, well, I'm not sure if it's charged. So now you got a double whammy on your hands. So here's a few other, other things that I like to carry additionally. Uh, again, tow ropes, extra washer fluid, windshield washer brush. I actually have a friend that refused to bring a, wa a windshield brush and uses his sleeve, believe it or not, to wipe off the snow from his vehicle. Always do a spare tire check and pressure check, road flares, flashlight for nighttime situations, and heavy duty work gloves for changing a spare tire when it's minus 20 outside. So now we're going to talk about gear organization and confirmation before a trip. So what you want to do is really confirm that the gear that you're taking with you is in good condition before a trip. Can't stress that enough. You want to do it before the trip and or not the day of or before, like a day before the trip. <clears throat> Excuse me. This will really reduce the amount of issues that you would have, let's say, if you're in the middle of the bush. So I personally like to make a, a list of gear that I'm going to be taking with me. That way I know what I'm taking. And I always like to document what I bring. So that Rambo and knife that we always talk about, I mean, if you always bring it with you year after year and you never use it, well, maybe it's time to ditch the Rambo and knife, okay? Gear checks include such as buckles, straps, Velcro, or also known as hook and loop in the sewing industry, zippers, saw blades, ax conditions. You don't want to find out that your ax handle is busted or, or, or broken before a trip. Stove condition and batteries. So I'll give an example of the stove condition. One of my friends that I go with a regular basis, winter camping, hot tenting, it was his turn that year to bring his stove and, and hot tent. And what ended up happening was his legs were seized on his stove because he didn't do any maintenance to it. And he found out the morning of uh, before our trip. So he brought the stove along anyways, and we had to use a piece of wood and try to pry open the legs. Again, that's one kind of surprise you don't want on your trip. Another good thing to do is look at your sled condition. 
and prep, make sure there's no damage, no damage, no holes. All the straps are there. All the loops are there. If you add loops to your, your uh, toboggan. What I also like to do is add wax uh, to the bottom of my toboggan, just like you, you would in, let's say skiing, the same concept, add a little bit of wax and you'll be surprised at how fast you, know, you, can, you can travel across snow and ice. Same thing with clothing, just like the gear, you always wanna check before leaving on your trip. Uh, anything like hats, gloves, socks, boots, coats. I'll give an example of boot liners. So that, friend, that same friend of mine that brought that C's uh, stove with him, he, he brought his boots, but what he forgot to check was the boot liners. So he was actually forgot to get them repaired, forgot to put them back in his boots, and now he brought his boots without boot liners. He wasn't a happy camper, let's put it that way. So again, Simple things, but yet in, in, the, in the rush to get things organized when you're working during the week, again, there's something simple like that you can uh, clearly miss. So this is what my closet looks like where I keep up my winter camping gear. As you can tell, I got the sleeping bags at the very bottom. All my gear is in totes. Uh, that way it doesn't get dusty, right? It's all contained. I know it's all there. Just a simple way of containing your gear and knowing where it is. So if you do need something quickly, you can go and grab it. So now we're going to get into the advanced uh, tent setups. <clears throat> so there are several accessories that you can purchase from various sources to make a more comfortable experience and uh, an easier way to set up your tent. A little bit of planning and research uh, will provide you some great ideas, especially doing some uh, YouTube searches or what I like to call YouTube University. Uh, browsing hardware stores and such will give you some fantastic ideas. And the best thing is really to talk to people go winter camping. They've been doing it for quite some time. They know what works and what doesn't work. And you can uh, generate some great ideas just by talking to people. First thing I'd like to mention is uh, having a tent fly. It was one year I went winter camping where it went from minus 10 to plus three with rain. And it was probably the most miserable experience I ever had when winter camping. Uh, it was raining so hard that the water was coming through the tent, believe it or not. So I vowed ever since then to bring a tarp with me or a tent fly. Now, you don't have to buy from the manufacturer themselves. You can use any simple tarp or fly that you have and just stake it out. It, it makes a, quite a bit of difference. Uh, first of all, snow easily slides off of it so when you have a heavy accumulation. And it also uh, creates a little bit more of a barrier for heat to bounce right back into the tent may take about another 10 minutes to set up, but it, it's, it's worth its weight in gold, believe me. Next thing I'd like to talk about is a ground tarp and blanket. I have a dedicated wool blanket for when I go camping. The more layers you have that you sleep underneath you and have below you is a lot better. It's more comfortable. You'll, uh, you won't be as cold. It does add a little bit more weight to your overall gear, but uh, I find that it works. It's, it's the best uh, system you can have by having a ground tarp and a blanket on top. And then of course, either an air mattress or a foam mattress and then your sleeping bag. So as I talked about before in my winter camping 101, I like to use bungee cords and guidelines instead of just using uh, let's say paracord and tying it to a tree. By using bungee cords in conjunction with the uh, guy outlines, uh, it's actually a lot faster setup. Uh, it's more flexible and in very windy condition or if it's more damp, especially the, the lines closer to the stove where it melts a lot faster. Um, as long as you use a commercial grade uh, bungee cords, cold climate, they're not gonna crack uh, in our climate. Uh, typically found that truck stops and industrial stores. So, so what I'm talking about is if you just easily put a loop on the end of a, let's say, a paracord, right? You wrap the bungee over a tree. You can easily, easily uh, erect your tent. And if it gets uh, starts to say, you can easily just retie that little loop or reposition your bungee cord. I find it's a lot faster. It took me years to figure that one out. For those people who own snow checkers, this is for you. So. As I mentioned before, anything that's gray, silver, white, and to some extent black, if you drop something in, in snow that's fairly deep that hasn't been compressed, you will lose it. I almost had one, uh, one of the brackets uh, being lost one year and I was frustrated and I vowed never that would never happen again. So what I did was you grab yourself some spray paint, 
whatever color you want. As long as you're able to pick it out, you spray paint it. And now if you were to drop it, you can easily see it. it doesn't cost much money, just a can of spray paint. You service them every few years because they do take quite a bit of punishment and pounding and you'll be able to see that much easier. Actually, I actually had a friend that lost one, had to order one from Snow Tricker. It's a, uh, again, it, it's a trip ruiner for sure. So now we're gonna be talking about temp shimming or spacing. So what we're talking about here is it's used to raise one side of the, of the actual tent, typically where the stove is located. This helps to maintain the critical heights of the stove jack to floor measurement. There are times where you may have to either dig out the area where the, where the stove is or, or reduce the amount of snow around the perimeter of your tent. It's a lot of work. I find that by shimming one corner, particularly where the stove is located, it will, it will save you a ton of time. And it's a lot easier to shim the, uh, the, uh, the stove than the tent when it's all complete. So when everything is frozen, trying to move that tent is almost impossible. Again, it's a lot easier to, to shim the stove. You will save a lot of time in aggravation and typical wood dimensions are two by four or four by six. So this is what I'm talking about. This is what it looks like as an example by shimming one corner. I bring some pieces of wood with me. These are not pieces of wood, the pieces of wood that you burn. These are ones that I actually keep. I bring with me on a, my trip every year. And I find that by, by making a physical uh, connection between the floor and the actual tent corner where the, where the pole goes in, um, it's, it holds that position. Now, some of you think, well, why not just use some snow and just build it up and, and do it that way? Well, the problem is that particular corner where the stove is, the snow always melts a lot faster. So by having a physical mechanical connection, it will always be the same height regardless. So this is what my shims look like. Right? Again, these are, not, these are not pieces of wood that you burn. You're just one that you keep with you. Typical wood, again, two by four that you find at any lumber store. Uh, some of the pieces of wood here I have, they're actually hardwood. It's because I have access to a wood shop. But whatever you can use, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Every year, I actually, every several years, depending on, on how damp they are, I do hit them with a little bit of uh, oil-based uh, uh, treatment. Apply it to a, a light coat to all sides. Every few seasons will be fine. And it just prevents the wood from rotting. Again, it's not something that you burn, you keep with you year after year. Now we talk about wood processing or chopping. Most of the damage done to your ax is by trying to split wood on the ground, right? And then by hitting rocks, this is how you chip your ax head. Uh, what I personally like to use is a, an actual chopping block which bring a chopping block will create a stable, firm, and safer platform. So it reduces the need to resharpen your ax every season. The thicker the chopping block, the better. That way it gives you, has less flex. And hardwood is ideal because it does uh, last a little bit longer. So this is what I'm talking about. So what I'd like to do is I like to actually bury this piece of wood, this piece of maple that I bring with me. I bury it about three quarters of the way in snow, and it brings a nice hard level surface that way you don't have pieces of wood rolling around and being so frustrated to chop. It makes it a lot easier to process wood. Again, this is something that you do not burn. You bring with you every year. And then once it gets to the point where it's really, really mutilated and damaged, then you can just chuck in the fire and, uh, and you're good to go. Now we talk about advanced stove setups. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's what my stove looks like. So now we talk about stove baffle and you're thinking, well, what the heck is a stove baffle? So basically a baffle is a metal plate located just at the top of the firebox below the exhaust pipe. It helps to keep the heated air flames and waste gases inside the firebox for a long period of time. Also known as a secondary air burn. So what happens is as the, as the flames go up, it wants to leave the box without a baffle. Uh, there are various ways of making baffles or installing baffles for your specific stove. Uh, a lot of good information, again, on YouTube or YouTube University, as I call it. It also reduces the wind blowing back into the stove itself. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if we look at a regular stove here, uh, once you have your wood that's burning away, the flames and the heat wants to go right up into the exhaust pipe very quickly. 
right? We want to be able to reduce that or minimize that. So if you ever look at your stove in the pitch black darkness, you'll see how all that, that uh, heat generated is quickly lost. My stove here is only at 250 Fahrenheit and you can see how red that is. All that wasted energy right up the exhaust pipe. We want to be able to contain that heat as much as possible. The more you do so, the more efficient burn you have. The less wood you have to burn. So by having a baffle installed, what you do is you're basically forcing that heat to go up around the baffle plate to the front of the stove, gets mixed in with some fresh air. It's still burning away, forces it back to the stove, and then finally up your exhaust pipe or, or your flue. So now with that baffle installed, if we take a temperature gauge to that, you can see here, I'm almost at 400 degrees Celsius. There's no hot spots. Everything is spread out evenly, right? A lot more efficient. And this is what basically it looks like in action. I'm not sure if you can see this. So you can see the flames have to hit the plates, have to move forward. It still gets mixed in with air. And then finally moves to the back of the stove up and up to, through the flue. So that's basically what it looks like, just one version of it. Um, use it as an aftermarket sort of uh, way of, of mounting it in your, in your actual stove. No fasteners, nothing like that. The problem with baffles is if you make your own design, how do you mount it? And that's one of the problems that uh, all the forums talk about. <clears throat> So now we're going to be talking about using an external temperature gauge. So burning wood, a wood stove that's too hot, and what's considered too hot is roughly around the 700 Fahrenheit mark or 371 uh, Celsius and above for extended periods of time on a regular basis will definitely damage the components of your stove or the tent itself. At the same time, the burning of fire that's too cold can lead to a buildup of an eventually burning fire and a buildup of creosote, which is a toxic substance. So typically, I like to use a, a gauge that magnetically sticks to the stove. I wouldn't say it's the most accurate sort of gauge, but for what it is, it'll give you a visual confirmation of roughly what that stove is. Easily found at most places. The I think hardware stores carry them, easily found online. Um, it is a wear and tear item. They don't last very long, uh, but uh, again, it'll give you an idea of exactly roughly where, where you're, you're at temperature-wise. And you can see this is what, I, what it looks like mounted on the stove. I try to keep it close to the pipe as, as possible. That's where all the, the flame and heat is going towards. What I like to do personally is clean my, my pipes every time I'm breaking down. That way I don't have to worry about making a mess at home. And I find that using a stainless steel brush uh, works the best in cleaning up the uh, creosote just because it's, the stainless steel itself is a lot more stronger material than let's say a regular standard uh, cold rolled uh, material brush. I also like to bring uh, kitchen uh, utensils or tongs with me. Um, I find that the bigger the actual tong itself, the better. You can easily rotate wood, uh, but more importantly, if you ever find a piece of wood that's damp and is causing you a lot of problems and doesn't want to keep the fire going, it's easy, you can easily remove that piece of wood with tongs as right? opposed to Trying to use a two sticks and using a leather glove, it's just a lot faster. Now we're gonna talk about a portable collapsible chimney support. I was asked by several people who participated in the 101 tenting uh, to show this again. As long as you have something that you can bring with you that is easily folds up, it's a lot faster than trying to find live wood or, or, or dry wood to erect your, your pipe. It will save you a considerable amount of time uh, setting up your tent. It should be something easy to break up and, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, set up and break down. It could be something as simple as, as pieces of sticks, pre-cut pieces of wood lashed together. Uh, again, it makes it for a lot faster, more enjoyable setup. Um, and it also reduces the amount of live green branches being cut off. And I'm a big fan of conservation.
Now we're going to be talking about a damper. So does anyone know a damper is basically used to control the airflow of the stove in, into the exhaust or the, or the flue itself? They are typically made of cast iron. If one were to break on you while you're actually uh, uh, camping, it is an absolute nightmare. And it almost would be like driving a vehicle at wide open throttle. I had one break on me on a solo trip a few years back. It was probably the worst experience I've ever uh, had to deal with. Trying to regulate that temperature by putting wood in without running the stove too hot and too cold, it was it was absolute uh, nightmare. Uh, I actually decided to pull the plug early and leave just because of so much of a hassle. So what I like to do is I always like to bring an extra stove damper. Uh, and I like to bring the whole thing with me, including the actual pin and extra spring and the cups, everything complete. That way, if something that does were to go wrong, I always have an extra one. Not very heavy, easy to uh, bring with you. And again, if we were to break on you, it'd be a lot of, lot of headaches. So now we're going to be talking about an air circulation fan. So if, if you notice, if you ever go with, with a pair or, or more than um, just more than two people, you notice that the person at the front of the tent where typically where the uh, stove is found, it's always the warmest, obviously, right? And you'd be like, oh, can you put another piece of wood on that fire? It's kind of cold back here. By bringing an air circulation fan, you'll avoid that problem or definitely minimize it. So it basically circulates warm air from the stove to the back of the tent. Um, it makes a noticeable difference where it, being at the back of the tent, the only problem with, with a little fan is that it's quite fragile and, and easy to bend uh, while in transport. So if you bring a bring in a nice, sturdy, heavy cardboard box, um, you can solve that problem. So this is what I'm talking about here. I saw this on someone's wood um, thick stove in their house. They had a little fan, uses no batteries. Uh, the heat itself generates electricity where it operates the fan. And once I saw that, I'm like, that'd be fantastic for winter camping. So. Uh, this particular uh, manufacturer, they have a very, very small version of it, small enough where you can easily bring with you. And again, it makes a huge, huge difference. So we take a, a look at a picture of what it looks like. If you don't have a fan, all that heat goes straight, uh, straight up the pipe, uh, right up the tent. But by having a fan, it draws that heat right back down. And then, of course, towards the operator. So I've, I've actually made a custom aluminum box for mine just because that it is uh, fragile. I had one and uh, with all the gear being thrown on top of it, it kind of got crushed. So I learned from my mistake. I made a little bit of a, a box for it. Again, as long as you find a, also a hard, sturdy, uh, thick cardboard box, it'll do the same. You'll have the same objective. That's what mine looks like in transport. Now we talk about stove mats. I find that the mat makes a big difference in reducing the amount of snow that's melted around the stove. It does reflect some heat back in the stove uh, and the surrounding, more, it's more important for the surrounding area. Again, it's a lot easier to shim the tent, than it, uh, excuse me, the, the stove than it is the actual tent itself. And it makes it, a, I find that makes a big difference from actually uh, from the perimeter of the stove itself. So now we're talking about wood, uh, uh, wood bases for stove legs. So they're basically like snowshoes for your, your stove. I find that if you don't use any piece of wood, uh, it actually uh, creates a lot more problems. You're always trying to uh, stabilize that, that uh, stove from, from melting into the ground. And the thinner and wider the piece of wood, the better, because it, it spreads the weight out evenly. Typically, I mean, as long as you can bring plywood, um, which is fine. And again, it protects the stove mat from being cut. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So you can tell here, I use, this, I use pieces of cedars that I just had easily available that I use, and I find it makes a big difference. That's what happens when you don't use it. So year after year of, of being in the same spot without any sort of piece of wood, it actually starts to cut the mat. It gets to a point where it becomes large enough where it actually uh, the heat will, will create a spot where it melts a lot faster. It, it makes it for a kind of odd setup. So I find that by using a piece of wood, it actually prevents that. Under stove heat reflector, I find that this is probably one of the best things you can do for your, your stove. It really reflects that heat right back into the stove itself. 
uh, increases efficiency of the stove by reflecting heat back into the stove, as we mentioned. It's typically made by, with a reflective side, and you really want that side to be uh, on the top. And typically, the higher the temperature rating, uh, the longer it will last. But there are some with 1,000 degrees Celsius, which do work the best, a little bit more expensive. Um, but again, this is one of the wear and tear items in winter camping. So now we're going to talk about stainless steel rods for the understove heat shield or the reflector. For whatever strange reason, most manufacturers of those uh, reflective mats do not include mounting rods. Boggles my mind why. It's like saying, I'm going to sell you a car without a steering wheel. Uh, so what you can do is uh, by having the pre-cut, pre-made uh, rods, it just makes it for a lot faster installation on your stove. If you use stainless steel, it's less maintenance. Uh, it can be simple as bending wire on a vise or a pair of pliers. Uh, very inexpensive to implement, and most of the raw material can be found at the uh, typical hardware store. So this is what mine looks like. I'm actually able to form a loop at the very end. It's easier to grab. And by allowing a little bit of a gap at the very end, you can actually lock into place in the wood, uh, or excuse me, into the stove leg itself. Again, if you don't have metal working equipment like I do, as long as you can bend it with you know, pliers, as long as you have some way of actually holding up the pair of gloves, that's really what you want. Heat reflectors, I really am a big fan of heat reflectors. It reflects quite a bit of heat back into the stove uh, and doesn't allow the heat to damage or burn the wall of the tent. My first three years, I would say, of hot tenting, just trying to figure out my own style, I was putting the stove too close to the back without a heat shield and it actually started singeing my tent. So if you look at one of my tents, uh, you'll see this, this big stained burnt mark that is an absolute eyesore and I vowed never for that to happen again. By using heat shield, you actually now can position the stove closer to the tent wall, which gives you a lot more interior room space. So this one picture that I have here just shows one typical design. The reason why you're probably thinking, why does it have that angle? That's because the way that my tent is angled, I can really put that really, really tight up against the wall. Again, it saves a lot of space. Here is another typical design that I have. Uh, again, it's I try to shield the, the stove as best as, or as much as possible. Uh, and actually, I have two of them, one for either side. Makes a big difference. And that's what it looks like in the closed position, folded flat. Again, material can easily be found at most hardware stores. Uh, you can go to a metal store, but it depends. Uh, they may not sell to the public, but I can easily found at most hardware stores. So now after your, after your trip is over, when you're exhausted, you're tired, you just want to throw all the gear in the basement. Uh, you just want to get it over with, you're tired. One of the ways you can actually damage a lot of equipment. And we'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's a great time to inspect gear if it needs any sort of repairs or items replaced. Uh, never, never, never put off repairing or, uh, or uh, replacing gear until next season. You probably will forget about it. Uh, and it's very important that you inspect it because surprises are I'll show them what I'm talking about. There was one year that I came back from a trip and I found this little, little gash on the actual gasket itself where the pipe goes through. So this is what happens when you run your stove for too hot for long periods of time. I actually lent out my tent to a friend of mine and this, this is a kind of surprise I got back. Uh, the actual thread uh, actually burnt away. So again, running in the stove for two periods uh, a long time. And also when you don't pay attention to how low the tent, uh, excuse me, the stove is sitting in relation to that hole. So basically the hole or the gasket is supporting the chimney itself as opposed to being centered within the hole itself. So ever since then, I always make sure that I always have an extra gasket on hand along with Kevlar thread. Very important that you want to bring Kevlar thread or have Kevlar thread. The reason is that if you use regular thread, it will instantly burn. So Kevlar thread is very specialized. It's de dedicated for that particular purpose of absorbing heat. Uh, it's the same sort of material or, or thread that they use for sewing uh, firefighters uh, uniforms or, or outfits. Okay? Very, Where very do you easy. buy it? So I have... Uh, Typically where you buy stuff like that is sewing supplies or suppliers that specialize in high heat applications. So there's one place I deal with in Toronto that 
they make custom uniforms for the firefighters. It is horribly expensive, I must warn you. Um, I get it at a discount price, and my price is $400 per pound. It is horribly expensive, like gold. Unbelievable how expensive. But again, you can't do it without it. It's one of those things that you must buy. So one of the downsides of camping is having to deal with all the, all the cleanup. Never store a tent uh, wet or damp. As you can see, it takes over my bathroom for a few days. and I, I leave it hanging up in my shower. As you can see there, I made some custom stainless steel rods that I, I, I wrecked in my, my shower. I let it hang there. And I rotate it every few hours, make sure it's completely dry. I get a towel and I wipe it down as best as I can. Uh, and you never want to store a tent with the zippers closed. The gentleman that was teaching the cold camping uh, 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 workshop I took years and years ago, used to work at a camping repair store and most of the problems he saw with tents is zippers being closed. If you ever try grabbing a zipper, closing it up, you'll, and you try flexing that, it doesn't want to flex very much. But if you open up that zipper and you try flexing it, it can move any which way you want. So that is the key secret here. Make sure you store it with zippers open. Same thing with your stove. You never want to leave it damp or wet or full of, of uh, damp wood. Uh, the leg will definitely seize out as my friend uh, uh, quickly figured out. Um, I like to use a lot of oil and I, I really smother my, my stove in oil. Again, I have a saying, an old farmer saying that grease and oil is cheaper than parts and labor. So I typically grab some vegetable oil or some flour oil, grab a rag and I just smother it as, as much as I can and then I store it. That, again, we're talking about long-term storage. If, if you know you're gonna be going winter camping next week again, there's probably no need to get hit with that much oil, but again, you wanna do some sort of maintenance, lubricate the hinges, all the pivot points, a little bit of, of oil will, will bring you, uh, take you a long way. So now you're probably thinking, oh, I find a, a, a massive hole in my, my sled, I'm just gonna chuck it. Well, you can actually repair it. There are kits out there you can actually buy for sleds. This is one model I have. Uh, typically found that most industrial plastic places where they, where they sell Delrin or UHMW, typically made for sleds. Again, you don't wanna uh, chuck out a perfectly good uh, sled if you don't have to. Unless of course it's absolutely mutilated and you can't fix it, uh, then yes. But for small holes, easily repairable. So basically what if you do all that, you'll find yourself having an enjoyable experience and uh, you'll be winter camping for many, many years to come. I hope you people enjoyed this presentation. Again, if you do have any questions, do let me know and I'll be glad to help you out. So until next time, friends, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you on the trails. So we could probably go through some points on the chat and sure. if anybody has any questions, we can field them, I guess. Maybe what we sure. should do is go back to the um, not sharing. So we see everybody. Yep. And then you could bring up your chat on the side, Luigi, and just maybe start at the beginning and just scroll through with some of the comment, well, not the beginning, but, you know, around 1030. So there was a comment from Rick at 1034 a.m. 1034, give me a second. Saying um, he had, uh, he was on a trip of a minus 39 Celsius and yep. a couple newbies with minus five bags so this is when you were talking about the, the pre stuff, uh, especially when you have newer people, you want them to have the experience. So it's good to look over what they have, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you find that you don't have the proper gear, it's just a lot easier to either borrow it or rent it. I mean, you can easily uh, get uh, minus 30 sleeping bags. For, uh, I think Mecca still does the rental program. Um, I believe you're bound as well does rental programs. So, I mean, if you don't have it, it's going to be a miserable experience with only a minus five bag. Um, absolutely. It's a lot easier to rent or borrow. So Rick, yeah. um, a comment hey. about your fan oh. and he's, hey. he puts his fan in an ammo box lined yep. with foam. Yeah. Another guy, Rooster, I used to use an old Tetley T-tin fit like a glove. Okay. 
Somebody yep. said they found the Kevlar spools online for 50 bucks a spool. Uh, um, you got to be careful with the with the cheap offshore uh, Kevlar. Uh, the the particular brand or company that I used, it's made in Montreal. Um, I find I used to use the actual import stuff. Uh, didn't last very long. Um, it it literally was cut the lifespan by I would say at least uh, a quarter. It was it wasn't uh, it wasn't worthwhile in my opinion. That's why I went with more expensive stuff. Okay. Um, well, Carolyn, right after that said, um, do you have a link to this company? So maybe um, you could somehow post that somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Once, once I find the, uh, the company name and, and I don't, I don't buy them a lot every year, obviously, cause it's so expensive yeah. and I don't go, I don't go through that, that spool, but I will most certainly look up a company and uh, I think they're located in North York, uh, in Ontario here, so I'll, I'll definitely find out that, that info and pass it on. Question from Rick. Pine boughs versus tarp as a hot tent floor. That's actually a very good question. Um, the only problem with you know, uh, pine boughs are, are great, don't get me wrong, they're, they're, they're really good. The only problem with, with that is now you're just, you're chopping the live trees and, and for the conservation purpose, I mean, if everyone did that, that you wouldn't have much of a forest left. So what I've gone to is, is using the actual a rubber tarp or, or a ground floor covering and putting a blanket on top. And I find that it works just as good as with bows. And the best thing with, with the actual blanket and your tarp is that you can roll it up or fold it and bring it with you. It's unlikely that you're going to be bringing the bows with you, right? So again, it, I always think about, about if you're not doing base camp, uh, base camping and you want to go from location to location, uh, just makes it more, more practical in my opinion to bring uh, the actual floor and, and the, let's say a blanket. Okay, we have a question from Clinton. He says, uh, for the tent wall material, what is best? Um, I would probably have to say cotton, just because when cotton is, uh, when it gets uh, damp, it actually uh, expands and swells and actually makes it waterproof. Now, there are some other material that, that's on market that I've been researching for years that is like, has the same uh, characteristics as cotton. Um, it's a lot more waterproof. The only problem is, is that it's horribly expensive. Like we're talking about maybe $60, $70 a yard. I mean, at, at that cost, I mean, a typical tent would cost you maybe three or $4,000. So the cheapest thing, the best bang for your buck and practicality really is cotton. What did I, just say? I didn't hear. Okay, we have a question from um, Ken Murray. Do you have a combination of strategies to reduce uh, stoking your stove throughout the night. So I guess when you load it, depending on the yeah. stove is, it might last 45 minutes, say an hour and a half or something, right? Yeah, I mean, it's my, my rule of thumb is whoever goes to the bathroom in the middle of the night, it <laughs> has the honors of putting some <laughs> some uh, wood into the fire. I mean, it's, we, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, we actually pick straws to see who actually does that if no one wants to volunteer. Of course, I'm always the last the one to actually, I, I cave and I actually go to the bathroom. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things where as long as you put all the vents and dampers to the lowest setting and you, and you keep it smoldering in a sense where that way, when you do put a piece of dry wood in there, it catches quickly. That's ideally what you want. And for the morning, I mean, if you do have some embers as you wake up in the morning, you know, hours later, yeah, the whole idea is you can put a piece of wood or some paper and get it going again ASAP. Okay. The, the one thing I would say, oh. Luigi, uh, there is uh, a lot of discussion of whether or not to burn the stove through the night or not uh, in terms of uh, both the fluctuations in the heat, but also yeah. in terms of carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. Yeah. I used to uh, I used to burn my stove through the night. And if you're in the boreal forest, you're burning, you know, deadwood spruce, which uh, doesn't burn for very long. You don't have much choice. Uh, and that means like every couple hours, even with a baffle, three hours, maybe. Uh, and, you know, you get these hot and cold and hot and cold uh, kind of uh, things. But also in terms of carbon dioxide, my, my sense, um, far superior is to get a 30 minus 30 bag and just let the fire die out. The, the big advantage for me in terms of doing multiple day trips, it's not the overnight fire. It's the ability to dry out wet stuff, right? The, the, the yeah. moisture accumulates and the sweat and stuff like that. 
So uh, I, I think burning overnight, I think it's a personal preference, but there is some uh, who would say that, you know, um, and I, I, I would say that, you know, it's probably, uh, it, it may be more pain than it's worth. Yeah, I, I, and I clearly know what you mean by that. I mean, my, my intent is not to keep the fire going intentionally during the, during the, the whole night, just that it's more, more importantly for the morning, I find, where you want to have embers, ideally in a, in a perfect world, embers. That way, you, all you can do is put some piece of wood and you get it going. I mean, I do have a minus 30 bag, but I mean, since I'm leaving the actual tent itself to go to the bathroom, I mean, I'm, I'm basically passing by the stove. So I'm like, eh, what's the, what's the harm, right? Throw a piece of wood in there and, and hope for the best that catches and you go back. But, but yeah, but the, um, the carbon monoxide thing, yeah, it's always a concern. I try to leave a little bit of a vent open on the actual tent that way you get some kind of fresh air. So yeah, it's uh, the fine line, that's for sure. And I think for people who are new, I would bring a car, because you can get battery powered carbon monoxide uh, uh, detectors for like 30, 40 bucks a Canadian tire. Yep. And if you're new, if you're just starting, you don't know how the, you know, how the airflow is going around the tent. I think that's a very worthwhile thing to bring. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a very interesting question here about peeing in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, now, who's originally brought this up? Uh, so I'm just trying to find the person who started it. Um, okay. So he mentions um, you don't really have to exit the tent if you have a pee bottle. This is Ronald. Uh, so that's an option for guys that uh, mm. one of the ladies here mentioned that and then, and, and I could, I could add something to that. We did have a lady who tried one of those um, uh, female funnel pee bottle things, but that did not work out because one fall trip I was on, it was actually minus two or three, but there was no snow yet. And all I heard is these two or three ladies that were sheltering in a, together. I heard, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> so it's complicated stuff to try to pee in the funnel and in the bottle. For a woman. Yeah, good point, Gary. And I mean, this is a family show, so I'm not going to get to great detail. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I do have some <laughs> female friends I go camping with. Yeah. Um, I'm fortunate to have a big group of, of campers I go with. But um, the kinder surprise by if, if you miss, remember, when you wake up groggy and in, and in you're freezing, remember, as soon as the fire goes out, the same whatever temperature is outside is inside your tent now. And trying to manhandle a bottle in the middle of the night with a snowstorm raging outside I'm not sure about you, but I don't have that kind of coordination. So I find that if I, if I stick with my base layers on, I can quickly dart outside, do what I got to do and run back in as opposed to with the bottle. And I've, I've seen people miss uh, with the bottle and make a mess in their sleeping bag. You don't want that little surprise for days on end when you're in the bush with a soiled bag. Believe me, you don't. So if you have the capacity to do that in the middle of the night where you can just wake up like a surgeon and just start going, I mean, or like one of those Navy SEALs, all the power to you, but I personally can't do that. Um, I, I do not want to experiment with that going forward. So uh, it's a personal preference, but yeah, I've, I've seen some uh, disasters over the years, let's put it that way. Yeah, I see one question here is tips on site selection and prep or anchoring. Um, obviously you want something very, very flat as possible, but I mean, a lot of times you're, you're always on a slope, right? So this is why I carry the shims with me just because uh, you're always going to have this issue. What I like to do is if I, if I find an area or potential areas, what I'll do is I'll, I'll trample it down with my, with my snowshoes and see how level it is. I'll give it about a minute or two to freeze over and I'll see how, how truly flat it is. Um, because again, I mean, it's, it's really, really bad or really, really slope. It's going to give you a lot more hassle just because as things start to melt, uh, things will want to slide around. So, um, I find that if I spend a little bit more time being more meticulous about my site, it, it, it leaves a lot of problems down the road in terms of anchoring. What I like to do is obviously if there's a lot of trees, I like to anchor to the trees. If there's not, then I like to grab some sticks, pieces of wood tie my, my, my rope or paracord to the actual piece of wood buried into the ground. And the reason why you're, you're probably thinking, well, why not some metal stakes? Well, the thing is if the metal uh, freezes to the, to the actual snow solid, that's not coming out. So now you're, you're losing money and now you're leaving that stake in the ground. If you leave the piece of wood, no big deal. Uh, they'll be there like it's a natural setting. So uh, that's what I personally like to do. Thanks, Luigi. Is there a, a strategy on 
wind direction and tent placement as well? Actually, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, what I didn't mention here, because I was worried about time is, depending on which way the wind blows, it can actually, if you don't have a baffle or a, a, um, a spark arrestor, it can be problematic. So what I like to do is, I like to bring a very small angled elbow, uh, HVAC elbow that I, I put the very tip of my, my chimney uh, pipes. That way I can now redirect that, that uh, exhaust and angle it away from the actual wind. That's only where situations where the wind changes like this in the middle of the night and it starts blowing back into the stove. You can easily add that to the end. Uh, easily found at Home Depot or any sort of HVAC or sheet metal store. Uh, that way you kind of alleviate that problem. And then of course the wind dies down, you easily take it out and you solve that problem. Awesome, thank you. No problem. Now typically, that's a very good point, Gary. Rapids, typically what I, what I like yeah. to do is I try to have at least one practical outing a year on winter camping 101. So I basically take out people that use my tent. That's a benefit of being a WCA member is if you don't have the gear, you can, you can always uh, find people that are willing to share. And what I do is I, I basically make it where I let you do all the work and I, and I guide you. And unfortunately we can't do that this year with COVID bring a wrench into everything, but that's what we typically do here at the WCA take people out, share the knowledge, uh, share the experience. And it's a, it's a great way to meet people again and learn a lot of, uh, of winter camping and other outdoor activities. Yeah, good point. Again, another question here about any recommendations on exhaust pipe size for, uh, for tent stoves uh, and any opinion on those roll up exhaust pipes. So I would say majority of the pipes out there and our dampers would be probably be five inches. Very, very common. You can easily find them at Home Depot or any HVAC specialty shops. Uh, in terms of those roll-up exhaust pipes, I'm not a big fan of those. They are very, very tricky. Uh, they don't hold their shape for, for a few years. Uh, they're more cumbersome. Um, I like to use the slip-on style where you can easily, uh, they nest into each other. They are a little bit heavier, but uh, it's less aggravation in, in my opinion. Another question I have uh, in the chat here is where did you buy your replacement damper? No, it was Canadian made. I actually got those made uh, from an actual uh, foundry here in Ontario. Um, I was fed up with, with those cheap uh, offshore uh, dampers. So if you want some more information on that, do let me know. I can give you some more information on that. Um, when I when I decided to get some made, um, Find him. I had a, a meeting with the VP of the company of, of the foundry and the head of engineering and the metallurgical engineer. And when I showed him the offshore version, he said, let me get, let me guess, that is for a, a NICO stove, portable winter camping. I'm like, how'd you know that? He says, because they always break. He says, yeah, I'll be, I'll be the first one to buy one if you do make them. And uh, I've talked to a lot of people. They, they're a very, very common issue. They do break in half right down the middle. So he knew exactly what I was doing. So yeah, um, a lot of people had enough with those imported uh, cheaper uh, dampers. So reach out to me later on via email and I'll give some more information on that. Uh, another um, question here is I have tips about light in a tent. So I had a uh, hot tenting 101 I did. I like to use candles personally. I like to use candles is that typically when the sun goes down at 430, if you were to use a headlamp for, for like, let's say 430 until let's say you go to bed at midnight, that's a long time to have a headlight. Um, by using a candle, you'll reduce the amount of, of batteries you use. But the more important thing for me personally is that by having a, a, let's say a headlight on your head and talking to people, you blind people all the time. So by having a candle actually spreads out the, the light evenly, it's not very hard on the eyes. Uh, typical candles you can find in most stores. I like to use the, the beeswax candles. I find that they last the longest. And uh, again, if you spill some wax, it's not a big deal. Another question I, I see here is uh, ideas for organizing uh, items in a tent. I find looking for stuff takes so much time. Absolutely. I mean, if you bring a regular backpack, it takes a long time to look for stuff. What I personally like to do now is uh, use a duffel bag. You can easily store gear in there. It's a lot bigger, it's a lot easier to this, uh, distribute gear out to people and you can easily just take a bag and give to someone. So I find that duffel bags work the best. I use duffel bags dedicated for uh, everything, a stove, um, clothing, everything. I have different duffel bags that way. I can easily pile them on top of each other. And uh, let's say 
with the duffel bag that I have my my personal gear with my all my clothing and stuff. I bring that inside the tent with me. That way, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to organize and just throw in in the morning. Okay, we had a suggestion about solar lantern, uh, yeah. luma luminad solar lightning as uh, a lantern, uh, wolf wolf ram. Maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great idea. The solar, I mean, any sort of free energy you can get, uh, the yeah, better. Yeah, that, that's what we used on the last trip, and they last a long time if they're not used on the highest setting. I mean, it doesn't make for a nice light like a candle. It's obviously much nicer lighting, but they're they're great. They provide a lot of light. Yeah, LED. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ab absolutely, they make a big difference, and if you can. Uh, Use them year after year, absolutely. It's a, it's a fantastic yeah. way to, to, to get light, for sure. Okay, we got a suggestion or, yeah, a suggestion from Marco. Presentation uh, would be winter tripping and moving and doing loops versus base camp. Um, so um, I, I generally cold camp mostly. And the reason I do that is it's a lighter version. It's a little more work to keep warm, but again, the way I do it is I was a big fire and everybody gets around the fire. So our front's warm, our back's froze. And then when we go to bed, you know, in essence, a lot of um, hot tents are cold camping at the end of the day. Um, so uh, we could do a presentation on that. I'll write that down. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done both uh, cold tenting. I actually started cold tenting before I, I switched over to hot tenting. And I find that the big difference for me is socializing in the evening where if it's cold tenting, now you're lying down, unless you have a fire outside and you're constantly rotating your body like a rotisserie chicken. I mean, you're, you're constantly either warm or, 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 yeah. or cold, more cold. So I find that at least with the hot tenting, you can all stay inside. You can, you know, make some tea or make some coffee, debate about politics or whatever you want. You can go to bed at midnight where if you're cold tenting, you're in your sleeping bag for hours on end, like maybe 14 hours. That's a long time to be on your back just lying there. So I find that for the more social aspect of it, it it's it's more practical. But I understand what Gary is coming from. I mean, hauling yeah. all that gear, there's nothing light about winter camping, believe me. So it's um, something, whatever works for you, and your friends that's really what matters yeah, yeah it, it there's two there's a pro and a con i mean you gotta again somebody mentioned you know you get wet when you're hiking so yeah. you get dry stuff uh you yeah. know and in a hot tent it's passive fine because you hang it up and i don't know six hours later it's bone dry when yeah. you're you know cold camping with a fire uh you're kind of passive drying because you're setting up racks and overhead stuff but everything gets pretty smoky it's dry but it's smoky and the benefit is you can move because you're not as you're not carrying 150 pounds around. You're, you know, in the 40, 50 pound zone, maybe, maybe 40. Um, we did a, a cross Queen Elizabeth II last year. It was about 50 K three days. Uh, the year before we attempted to do a double crossing, but we ended up getting rain on the second day. So the lakes were flooded by, you know, an inch of water. So we just sat there. And then it froze to minus 17. And so it was like on a skating ring for the next third day. <laughs> so we ended up cutting that trip a little shorter. So we, I think we did a five day trip, but I guess that all sums up that I could do a presentation on coal camping and, you know, traveling. Cause in essence, what winter camping for me is in the winter is it's like canoeing because you're really following the lakes and ponds and you're, you know, jumping ponds, usually by portages, uh, if you're in a provincial park. If you're crown landing, well, then you're just going through the woods to the next, you know, pond. Because the ponds and the lakes are the highway. Um, the big danger of all that is, you know, moving water. So you got to really read your surrounding and make sure you're not crossing in moving water areas. Yeah, that's a very good point, Gary. And uh... Again, I, like I said, I've been doing this for 15 seasons. Um, when I first started cold tenting, I, I, I would say in my 15 years, I've gone into the water three times. Now we're not talking about being completely submerged, but I would say knee level or 
or almost thigh level. And now it's now that if that happened to you while you're cold camping, you're, you're either going home right then and there or you're being rescued. Where in hot tenting that happened, you can get quickly go back to your tent, change your clothes. That's why I always bring a full size towel with me, change your clothes and you're okay. You know, you'll laugh it off later on, but I mean, you gotta be very, very careful if cold tenting uh, doing those uh, crossings, absolutely. Yeah, I could, I could speak to that. Um, again, we have these presentations at Five Winds geared to what do you do in various scenarios because basically five wins is a backcountry ski that we go out we get dropped off somewhere and then you know hike or ski snowshoe for five six hours and then we pick up the bus again and come back to Toronto but we've had people you know had you know you know when you're crossing a creek or something uh, or a little pond or something uh, get a soaker so there's oh, yeah. things you can do and it all depends on who's with you, what do you have available, how cold is it, there's various scenarios, but we have presentations on that. So I could give those presentations. Um, and I think Kathy, Kathy's been in five wins and I think Sandro too. So there are a few people in boat clubs, but I think it's a good idea. Maybe we can introduce that and uh, put together a Zoom meeting. Another question that I see here is what size uh, snow checker tent do I use for my solo trips? And I have a eight by 10 crew. I find that, I mean, I can bring all my gear inside if I want, or if someone's going to meet me at some point uh, during the trip, um, there's enough room for both of us, but it's just big enough to, to have space and small enough where you can manhandle easily by yourself. Okay. Lori had a question. Any tips about box size and material for toboggan? Hmm. Well, in terms of box size, it really depends on how much gear you're hauling with you. I find that if you're going solo uh, uh, trekking, I mean, you're, you're, you have to bring all the gear with you anyways. Um, but if you're going with multiple, uh, like a group, you can easily break that gear down. So it really depends on, on what you bring and how long you're going for. So it, it really comes down to kind of a personal thing of, of how much you, you bring. Like I have a friend of mine that brings everything. I mean, everything. Full size chair, full size shovel, full size uh, splitting mall axe. Uh, it's unbelievable. But I mean, if you're one of those people that goes light, you can bring a, obviously a smaller, uh, lighter, you can bring a lot smaller container. But uh, yeah, it and that's where the experience comes in. It's, it's literally trial and error. I would say it, it takes about three seasons before you kind of figure out your own style and, and your own setup and what works what, uh, best for you. Uh, Lori has a question, wooden boxes. So I guess you're talking about the toboggan. Yeah, in terms of the actual toboggan itself, uh, what I like to use is a plastic uh, sled from Pelican. I find that they, they take quite a bit of punishment. And uh, I mean, whenever I do come across a huge hill, I, will, I jump on the toboggan, I go down the hill. I and mean, I'm not gonna walk down if I have to. But um, in terms of wood boxes, you can, you can lash as long as your, 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 your sled is wide enough and you can actually lash it down, you can definitely bring wood boxes. Only problem with the wood box is now it makes it additionally, uh, makes it a lot more heavier. So uh, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. I mean, you won't notice it too much when you're just crossing flat ground, but when you start going up hills, yeah, you'll definitely notice that weight. Yeah, some very good information there. Yeah, as long as long as you do some research and and browse some of the sites, you, there's a lot of great information out there. I just gotta be careful where you get your your sources from. Uh, but again, there's there's lots of lots of information out there. Again, the best thing to do is talk to people go winter camping, see what they're set up. I love to see people's winter camping set up. It gives me so many ideas and like, oh, I never thought about doing something like that. So, absolutely, absolutely. I can counter, I will also support that is the more trips you go on, you learn from everybody uh, and it's positive and negative. Oh, that did not work or yeah, that's fantastic idea, you know? So it's, it's experience. It's good to, you know, have somebody give you a presentation. So you got the fundamentals, but when you actually start doing it and what I would suggest to many people is don't leap into minus 40 weather you know, start off with fall camping when you sort of get bored. Okay. Now you're introducing snow, you know, at a moderate level of, you know, minus 10 or something like that. 
And then you, you, you know, you start handling all the scenarios are really cold. It's raining on you. It's really cold, you know? So now you're, you can handle almost everything once you get to that point, you know? Yeah. Good point, Gary. When I first started uh, cold tenting, I actually uh, asked my friend if I can use his backyard and try it out. Cause I had no idea about, about uh, yeah, winter camping. Point. Yeah. I mean, I, my friends, uh, a lot of, at the time, a lot of my friends didn't do anything like that. My family definitely didn't do anything like that. I mean, they're like, let me get this straight. We we migrated from the old country to come to Canada for a better life. And you want to sleep underneath a tent in the middle of winter? Are you mad? Yeah. So as long as you try it out first and you actually like it and being comfortable, I mean, again, when it's minus 20 outside with, with plus the wind chill, I mean, it can be a quite frigid cold tent thing, right? So Try it out first in the backyard. That way, if you don't like it, you can pull the plug in the middle of the night and say, you know, forget this, I'm going inside. But uh, the last few years, I've had uh, cold tent, well, new tents or new gear. I'll try it out car camping. Like I'm local to Killarney, for example, which is open year round. So I'll just mm -hmm. reserve a site, test out my setup, kind of iron out a few details as I'm going yep. about before actually hitting the back country, getting a little, a little further away from isolation. You know, worst case scenario. Hit, shit hits a fan you uh you can just go to your car <laughs> and yep. uh you know or you know at least at the end of your kind of easy access to it maybe some spare stuff that you have in your vehicle a, a walk away kind of deal yeah absolutely to highlight that um i saw somebody in mew lake Algonquin park this is years ago 10 years ago they you know we had these yurts um which is when i was family car camping with like family over the Christmas holidays, but there were a few people at uh, plug-in sites and they didn't bring a hot stove. They just brought a heater and plugged in. So that's a cheat way to do it. You're, you've got your tent, you're in it and you put a heater in it, the electric heater, you know, and I talked to them, they were fine. And it's a good way to introduce the family to uh, winter camping. Absolutely, very good point, Gary. Yeah. Another question I, I see here is, do I take cots? I don't take cots. Cots are way, way too heavy. Now, unless you're, you're going on, on uh, sleds or snowmobiles, that's a whole other conversation. But if you're physically, manually hauling in your gear, that can be quite heavy. Be quite heavy. Okay. I, I had a couple of friends that had that. You still have to bring your insulated pad. Yep. Um, the other thing I've had, some of my friends have um, hammocks. And you basically have to put a sleeping bag under the hammock. So you're sleeping on your pad in the hammock and there's an under quilt or something. Yeah, it's an under quilt. I do, hammocking. I do hammocking in the summer and I have the gear for winter camping with the hammock as well. And so it's basically a sleeping bag on the underside of your underside yeah. of your hammock because uh, just like anything else you compress your insulation it's not doing anything right so that's yeah. the whole concept and you yeah. need one of those in, in the summer as well or a variation of it or something to insulate you from underneath yeah absolutely any other questions people comments concerns again if, if you people forget and later on say oh i forgot to ask that Again, I'm always a, a text message, email, phone call away. Uh, I'll do my best to respond ASAP before you head out on your adventures. We have one question here about um, this Kate, which I guess is not Kate, it's Brian, I guess. He was talking about, do you, you know, he's got an unpinning kit, IED pinning kit, I guess to haul his, is uh, sled up a steep slope or something. Uh, my solution is I go light, <laughs> so there's no issue that way. But I can imagine when you're carrying whatever your sled is, 150 pounds, <laughs> you're limited to how steep you can go. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't try to avoid the hills just because I bring a lot of, I mean, I'm a big uh, sweet guy. I, I love my, my hostess cupcakes and McCain cakes and all that sort of jazz, so. I mean, I tend to, tend to burn off those calories, but yeah, going up those hills do remind me of all, all the weight I'm carrying, but uh, that's part of the program. I mean, that's what you signed up for, right? It's, uh, it's tough. Bring some rope. Yeah. Or you can, uh, if it's really steep, yeah, you can bring some rope, but uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's one heck of a workout, that's for sure. My very first winter camping trip was a hot tent trip. I rented all my gear from Lure the North and went to Killarney Backcountry. And uh, on the way there, it was fine. I went to Kakaki Lake, which is not too far off the main road. But 
on the way back, I realized that portage that I went down the nice steep hill was just glazed with ice. And uh, I had no rope, uh, at least one that I couldn't use that long enough. So thankfully, the lanyard my, on the, the toboggan I rented was long enough for me to get up partly up the hill. And then I was on all fours kind of grasping at a little root that was sticking out from this uh, glazed hill and kind of pulling this toboggan all the way up. Yeah. yeah. Lesson learned. Bring rope <laughs> just <Yeah>. in case. <laughs> One of the things with five winds is because we're back country and we're, we're going cross country. We're ponds and rivers and everything going across. Uh, we have at least one throw rope in the group uh, because if somebody goes up to their armpits and you don't want to go right to them, I mean, we got ski poles, there's different techniques, but basically the rope's the safest to stay, you know, clear. And uh, again, when somebody gets wet, they start losing their dexterity and their fingers and stuff. So you can always have like a, a fixed loop and they, you know, you throw it at them and they put it under their arms and you can pull them out. Question is how best dry to dry uh, ski boots when it's really cold out uh, without melting by the stove. The best thing to do is just uh, either hang them up uh, by the, uh, by the ceiling. That's if you have a internal frame, you can just hang them or you can place them just not too far away from the actual stove and monitor the actual uh, temperature and, and the, the actual boots themselves. I had a friend of mine who put his liners too close to the stove and actually burnt them. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he try to get too aggressive, Frenchy. but yeah, basically you're, you're constantly monitoring that. The thing how soaked there, if they're, if they're almost dripping off, so you got a bigger problem on your hands, but yeah, I mean, you're always monitoring that situation. You never want to leave it unattended because it's amazing how fast things can catch on fire or burn. Well, people, if there are no other questions, uh, comments, concerns, stay safe out there, and we'll see everyone on the trails. Bye now.